evening, everybody. Let's all stand and grab our hymnals and turn to page 495. Page 495. Since Jesus came into my heart. Page 495. Page 495. Let's sing it out on verse number one. Oh, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, now in verse number four, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know, since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since came into my heart. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm certainly glad that you're here. And uh, it's good last night, and, and it's been good all week. So you listen very carefully, and may God bless you today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for, uh, Lord, the Word of God. Thank you, Father, that it's clear. I pray, Lord, that we would have an open mind, open heart. pray that you speak to us. Thank you, Brother Gibb, given his time to come here this week. Pray that you'd bless the teaching, Lord, tonight in Jesus' name. And amen. Any of the preachers slipped in uh, since last night? Your pastor, full-time Christian work, if you'll stand, please introduce yourself. Anybody, if you would, preacher right here, if you would. Thank you, my brother. So good to see you again. Wonderful. Anybody else? All righty, good. Okay, Brother Gip, you come on, man. You're on right away. Well, amen. Good to be saved. Yeah. Good to be in church. Yeah. Good to see me. Yeah. Okay, by this time tomorrow, Stephen Anderson will make a video of me saying that and say something about it. I am blessed. And I'll tell you why I am blessed. You know, uh, <clears throat> let me tell you what you guys got to do, all of you, uh, all of us. Get rid of your pride. You know, by pride cometh contention. I am not sure that pride isn't the worst sin that there is because pride is what keeps a lost man from getting saved. Pride is what keeps a Christian from getting right. Pride is what keeps somebody from saying, you're right, I'm wrong. Isn't that true? And I got a lot of problems. I don't have a pride problem. And that helps me. Uh, because then when somebody lies about me, I don't take it personal. Um, some time ago, some guy lied about me. I'll tell you about it uh, tomorrow night. <clears throat> some guy lied about me and I just... You know, I, I just, here's what a lie is. Uh, I, I say, tell people a lie is a four-step process. Somebody hates you. They want to say something bad about you that is true. Um, they, they checked you out real good and can't find anything bad that's true. So they made something up. So if somebody lies about you, that's an honor. They have actually, when somebody lies about you, they are actually confirming your honesty and your purity. And so... Um, I guess Stevie Anderson, I just saw it for, for, uh, for the thing. Stevie, keep watching. We'll get you something tomorrow night. Watch tomorrow night. Anyway, um, uh, he put a thing on me, and he's got a rapper, and he's got me doing rap. Now, think about this. I've been here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, and he hasn't refuted one scripture. Now, there's two reasons why he hasn't done it. Number one, he, it can't be refuted. Number two... He doesn't do his own work. He is in somebody's pocket. I'll talk to you about that tomorrow night. He's just a little boy. He's a puppet. And he can, they'll bring something out, try to refute scripture in about a week when, when whoever his masters are, they have the chain around his neck. Uh, when they give him the stuff and say, hey, boy, go say this in front of the camera, he'll obey his masters and he'll say something. But all they can do is, all they can do is put something to, uh, to, to make me look bad. Guys, look at this. How can he make this look worse? 
See, I told you, no pride. Uh, he, he had a thing on here when he heard us coming. He says, well, you know, Gip isn't very intelligent. I never said I was, but I'm smarter than a 12-year-old. And he's 12 years old, okay? And I'll prove that tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night, you know, guys, notice this. I have not, I, I've mentioned him. I have not attacked him. And like people say, well, you're not being very nice to him. Well, he's not being very nice to me. I never said he's going to hell. Isn't that the worst thing you can say about somebody? He didn't say I deserve hell. I'll tell you I deserve hell. So do you. There's a person on this planet that doesn't deserve hell, okay? But um, when, when somebody's got grace with him and not with me, I know they don't have grace. When they defend him, but they won't defend the Bible, he doesn't ha they don't have grace. No, right. Don't get to say, well, you, you just need to have some more grace. Yeah, that's kind of like, uh, do you ever hear how the, how the, how the uh, Congress, the Democrats always go, well, you Republicans, you just need to learn to compromise a little. You ever notice Democrats never compromise? All right, we'll right, talk to you tonight um, uh, about the nation of Israel uh, and, uh, and is God done with Israel? And I'll give you the, I'll give you the answer now if you want to leave. No. <laughs> Didn't that save you some time? Um, but he is not done with Israel, uh, and there are some. There are going to be a lot of scripture now. In a little while, we'll have some guys pass this stuff out because these are some scripture references. What these sheets are <clears throat> is they are uh, just a bunch of references in the Bible, and we're just going to keep you from having to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. You'll have, and you can take the sheets home uh, with you. But uh, one of the things about uh, about Israel, uh, when you study Israel, you got to understand the difference. Between, between covenants, and there's two kinds of covenants in the Bible. There's conditional covenants, and unconditional. Now, if you just said, all God's covenants are unconditional, that's because you never read your Bible, and you think if you beat your chest loud enough, that makes a difference, okay? You know, guys, the, loud, the, the, more, the more fearful somebody is, the louder they yell. The more scared they are, the more, the more they bellow. But there are conditional covenants, and there are, there are unconditional covenants, uh, and we need to take a look at them. Uh, go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 9. Do you, know what a, do you know what a conditional covenant is? Oh, you guys all know what a conditional covenant is. How many of you have a job? That's a conditional covenant. Doesn't, does, really, isn't this basically what your, your employer says? If you will do this, I will give you this. Okay? So here's a guy, here's this guy, he's got money, and some 20-year-old kid gets done mowing his grass, and he walks up to him, and the guy pulls out his wallet and gives him money. What is that? You do the grass, I give him money. Then another 20-year-old kid doesn't do a thing, and he walks over and he gives him money. You say, why do you do that? Because that's his son. Son don't have to have it, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, in um, uh, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 9, <clears throat> this is where the Lord is talking to Solomon. And the big word, whenever you see, here's how you can identify a, a conditional covenant. If, then, if, then, if, then. If you'll mow my grass, then I'll pay you. If you'll paint my house, then I'll pay you. If you'll work five days a week in the auto plant, then I'll pay you. That's a conditional covenant. You don't show up, you don't have a job. Look what he says to Solomon, verse 4, And if, there it is, if thou wilt walk before me, as David thy father walked, in the integrity of heart and in un unrighteousness, uprighteousness, uh, to do according as to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgments, here's the second half of it, then I will establish thy throne over the, uh, of the, the, the throne of uh, thy kingdom upon Israel forever. As I promised to David thy father, saying, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. So, so Solomon had a conditional covenant, right? Now here's an amazing thing about Solomon. Solomon is, uh, Solomon is here, because of God's unconditional covenant with his father, David. You'll see that in a minute. There's an unconditional covenant. You say, well, then how could, ha how could God have a conditional covenant, uh, an unconditional saying, you're going to have a man always on the throne, and yet uh, Solomon 
didn't keep his covenant. Solomon did not keep his covenant, and Solomon doesn't get to keep a man on the throne. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is the most famous, and this is not a trick. This is simple. Who is the most famous son of David? Solomon. There's no doubt about it. I have a, I have a message called the most important. Keep that word in mind. Not, so, not, not, not famous, but important. Uh, I got a message called the most important son of David. And then I go through here, and I can't remember, I don't have the outline with me, but there are, there are scores of scripture that refer to Solomon, 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 because he is the most famous, he is not the most important. You know why? Because his line comes through Joseph and dead ends. But Solomon's son, Nathan, the line goes through him to Mary. So he's the most important. And that's why Solomon, he, he gets on the throne, but his, he didn't keep that covenant, so it won't be a son of Solomon that always sits on a throne, It'll be, it, but it will be a son of David. So that is a conditional covenant. God says, Solomon, if you will do this, then I will do this. Now, you guys know what the, the Davidic covenant is? The Davidic covenant is an amazing thing. God says to David, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to give you somebody on the throne. Uh, he says, I I'll give you sure mercies, the sure mercies of David. Isn't that true? David has a very unique standing because he was a man after God's own heart, right? Anybody else ever get that covenant? Do you think of anybody else in the Bible that God said, I'll do for you what I did for David? Because there's another man. There's another man that God said, now think about this, I will do for you what I did for David. So, oh, come on, how can that be? I'll, I'll show it to you. Look at chapter 11, 1 Kings chapter 11. And in 1 Kings chapter 11, and uh, look at verse 38. You, you know who he's talking to? He's talking to Jeroboam. Now, let me help some of you, because, uh, guys, <clears throat> I, don't like, uh, I don't like Muslims hating my country. Uh, I don't like Democrats hating my country. And I don't like Bible believers hating my country. And you've got some Bible believers, you know. No, that, it's, like, it's like they believe the same thing that, that the Muslims believe. America's the great Satan, uh, and they won't be happy until it falls. You know, in case you guys don't know this, this is the boat we're on. You know, if I had been on the Titanic and I heard that statement, even God couldn't sink this ship, and, and it was starting to go down, contrary to the will of God, I'd be bailing. You say, why? Because I'm on that boat, okay? But I've heard these guys, they'll say this, uh, Bible believers will go, well, this country started with a rebellion, God never institutes or, or blesses a rebellion. That is a wonderful statement, as long as you don't read your Bible. Look at, uh, look at chapter 12, 1 Kings chapter 12. Here's what the Lord says. He, uh, Abijah, the, the man of God, stops Jeroboam and he said, I'm going to split this kingdom. That's the day that they all became Baptists. And um, he said, I'm going to split this kingdom. And he said, I'm going to give you ten tribes. And I'm going to give the house of David, Rehoboam, I'm going to give him two tribes. Well, that wasn't a rebellion. Really? Then read your Bible. Look what it says. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 19. So, so Israel, what? Rebelled against the house of David unto this day. Your Bible says it was a rebellion. And it was a rebellion instituted by God, initiated by God. Don't feel too bad about that because he also has a record for breaking people out of jail. Which I tell folks, I said, that encourages me for my future. <clears throat> so here's Jeroboam, and he says, he, Abijah says, now look, uh, Rehoboam's not doing right. Uh, I'm going to split this kingdom. I'm going to give him two tribes, and you're going to get ten. But look at the promise that he gives to Jeroboam. Look at verse 38. And it shall be, there it is, if, that's conditional, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that that is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as David thy servant as David my servant did that, that that I will be with thee that's the then and build thee a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel unto thee did he, did he just not give him the same promise he gave David can you imagine we, you know, that's only two people in the history of the world 
that God ever made that promise to, and only one of them lived up to it. Because this guy no sooner takes, takes office than he goes, oh man, I got 10 tribes, but, but Rehoboam's got Jerusalem, and my people are Jews, and they're going to go down to Jerusalem, they're going to worship, uh, and, and then those guys down there are going to go, why don't you guys get back together, and they're going to kill me. So he said, I've got to give them some place to worship. So he went to Dan and, Be and Bethel, and he put up a, a, a golden calf, two golden calves for Israel, and said, Israel, worship here. Uh, I told you, Kathy and I were in, uh, in Israel in, in uh, September, I think, September of 2014, and up in Dan, not in Bethel, but in Dan, the, the complex is still there that he built. It's just walls, just basically like the foundation, like you knock the house down, you can see where everything was. The pedestal where that golden calf was that, uh, that Jeroboam built is still there. So it was an if, but it didn't come to pass because he didn't keep the conditions of the covenant. So guys, God has conditional covenants with some people. Then he has unconditional covenants. Uh, take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 2. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, Or I'm sorry, chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, <clears throat> look what it says in verse 4. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? You know, here's what's happened. David's gonna, David says, you know what I'm going to do? God's living in a tent. I'm living in a nice house. God's living in a tent. I'm going to build a house for him. And what God comes back with is, you know, I never asked anybody to do that. I've always been dwelling in tents. You're going to do this for me? And it was just an amazing thing. One of the things I told the students this morning, you know what you ought to do? You ought to do something for God. Do uh, you know I can reduce your prayer life to uh, four words? Most of your prayers I can reduce to these four words. Tell me if this doesn't describe most of your prayers. Lord, change my circumstances. Change my financial circumstances, my health circumstances, my, my legal circumstances, my marriage circumstances. But isn't that really, I know you say, oh, well, preacher, I prayed for an hour and a half and I cried. But that's all you said. We always go to God. We really don't want to talk to God. We want to talk to Santa Claus or a good banker. Right? God, give me this. God, give me this. I wish you would give this to me. Would you ever give him? And don't, please don't go, I gave him me. No wonder he's mad at you. But, uh, but the fact is, guys, really, have you ever given anything? You know, somebody is doing something here. It might be sin. It might be not. It just isn't what a Christian ought to do. Wouldn't it be nice if you went to the Lord and said, you know, Lord, I'm going to quit doing that. I'm going to do that just for you. Uh, I was telling him this morning, I don't know for sure. I'm not trying to. I got a question. I will never, I'm never seeking the answer to this question. I got saved in, uh, in 1970, June 1970, <clears throat> and I quit drinking. I was in a bar every night before I got saved. Uh, after I got saved, I went back to the bar two times. First time was to tell my friends I got saved, didn't have a drink. Second time uh, was to tell them I got called to preach. Now, you talk about it, put a chill on a meat, and that'll do it. And, um, and that was it. And here's, what I, here's, here's, here's my statement. Maybe I still like the taste of beer. I don't know, because I didn't quit because I didn't like the taste. It was a gift. After what he gave me, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change my jokes. I'm going to change my language. I'm going to change my hairstyle. I'm gonna, he even changed it more. I'm going to change, uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change how I live. I'm going to change how I dress. I'm going to change what I, I'm going to change my entertainment. I'm going to quit my drinking. You understand? Sure. Have you given him anything? And let's face it, guys, I mean, give him something that you want. You know, when I was a Catholic and they'd have this thing called Lent, and Lent, that's what you pick out of your navel, but um, you know what I used to give up every year for Lent when I was Catholic? Peas. And I could expand it to uh, liver. Yeah, I'm hearing nothing about peas, brother. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, I said, I don't like peas. Somebody said, you ever taste them? I said, I have smelled them. And my nose has told my stomach horror stories about peas. 
and my stomach has believed every word my nose told him. But, but I'd give up peas. Well, that was easy to give up. Never liked them anyway. Guys, what did you do? You give up something you didn't, didn't care about anyway? Wouldn't it be nice if you said, Lord, let me do this for you. Let me give this up. You could, you could do something for God. You could give him something one of two ways. There's something in your life you ought to just say, Lord, I really like that music. You ever hear these, uh, you know, the uh, Christian uh, theme parks? They call them contemporary churches. And they, and, and they play rock Christian music. And I've had guys say this, that rock music. Uh, I said, well, you listen to that Jesus rock music. But I like that kind of music. Can I ask you a question? Here's what I ask those guys. Who said you should be listening to music you like? Well, guys, there's a lot of stuff you like that isn't good. So, oh, so you're just going to sanctify what you like. So, you, so maybe some of you just need to get rid of some CDs. Maybe you just need to tell Lord, Lord, I'm going to, do, I'm going to get rid of this. Maybe I got liberty to do this. I think I'll just surrender my liberty, try to give you a gift. Or, in this case, he gave him something positive. Maybe you could give God something. Maybe some advances come through and you could really bless him in some large financial way. I don't know, but... Um, but David says, I'm going to build a house for God. Man, isn't that amazing? No wonder he's a man after God's own heart. I tell folks, I said, we haven't had a house in 31 years. If I get a mansion, if I have a mansion over the hilltop, over the hilltop if I got a mansion, you're going to see me walking around the outside looking at it. I say, what are you doing? Making sure there's no wheels. We've been on wheels for 31 years. We make sure there's no wheels. So look what it says. <clears throat> Verse 5. Uh, Go tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not uh, dwelt in any house <clears throat> since the time that I brought up the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked uh, with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people, uh, Israel, saying, Why built ye not me a house of cedar? Now therefore, go, uh, so shalt thou Say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee, uh, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men of all, the, of the, all, the, all in, that are in the earth. Moreover, uh, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, uh, and they shall dwell in a place of their own. Hey, does that sound like it's prophetic? I mean, that still hasn't completely been finished. And move no more, neither shall the children of, of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Guys, that's got to be prophetic. Are their church, right, is Israel in a place right now? Are they dwelling safely? Are there people that says, uh, are there people that are afflicting them right now? then that, those two halves haven't come true. He's put them in the land, but they're not dwelling safely, and there are people afflicting them, then this, this verse has not yet been fulfilled. If God is replacing Israel, he's not keeping that word. Verse 11. Now, and since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and caused thee to rest uh, from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee uh, that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled... Uh, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Question, did anybody see in anything that I just read the word if? There is no if. He said, I'm going to do this for you, right? That You know what that is? That is an unconditional covenant. Um, 14, I will be his father, he should be my son. Uh, if, he quit, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, uh, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So, the Davidic, the Davidic covenant is an unconditional covenant. God said, he doesn't say, if you'll do this, I'll do this. He said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for you. Now, that brings us to another covenant. 
And this is the one that we're talking about tonight, the Abrahamic covenant. Look at Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Look what the Lord says. Verse 1. <clears throat> uh, now the Lord sa hath, had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, uh, unto a land that I will show thee. Now, you say, well, that's an if, isn't it? No, he's telling him to get out of there. A condition is throughout, throughout the condition, throughout the covenant. In other words, when you get hired and you go to work for a week, you get paid for a week, right? But if next week you don't go, you don't get paid. You have to continually go, go fulfill your side of the covenant. So a conditional covenant is whoever God makes that covenant with, they have to keep doing this, then God will do this. Sure, he told them, get out of the land, go down there. But he didn't say, if, there's no if. He said, go on down, do this. Look at verse 2. Uh, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There is no condition to that covenant. God just says, Abraham, here's what I'm going to do. By the way, did you notice that we are in the Abrahamic covenant? Say how? Be good to the Jew, and God is good to you. Yeah, you know, I love these people. Uh, yeah, these guys, you know, they get, they get uh, uh, you know, like spectacular, reactionary. You ever have anybody say this? But the Jews run the banks. I had a guy call me one time. And he likes, you know, he was reading my, my, my uh, newsletter, I, one of my essays or something. And he goes, uh, he goes, I like your letters. I said, okay, good. Uh, and I like what you say, good. Usually I know there's but. And he goes, but. I said, yeah, I thought that was coming. And he goes, uh, but you know, you talk about Israel like they're good. I said, well, they're God's chosen people. I tell, I'm going to say this again. I do not believe that Israel was God's chosen people. I believe they still are. Now, Stephen Anderson, when he, takes the, when he takes the sound bite out of that, he'll take me out saying, I don't believe Israel was God's chosen people, and then he'll have me saying that. But that's okay, because he's dishonest. And if you have to be dishonest, that shows that what you're teaching is not honest and is not real. So the fact that the guy is, is playing uh, uh, video games with me doesn't bother me at all. It honors me. You know, every time you see him making fun of me, you know, just say this. Look, Anderson can't answer the scripture again. And so, um, anyway, I get this. I said, they're God's chosen people. And he goes, he goes, they run the banks. I said, yes, they do. I said, that's the way God plans it. Hey, if you, if you don't like Jews running the banks, I'm with you. Let's take them Jews away from them. Let's take them banks away from them Jews. Let's give it. Let's give those banks to the Catholic Church. Right. I'll bet they'll be fair and square. Right. No, you guys act like you don't trust the Catholic Church. Okay, then, then you're such bigots. Let's just give it, let the Muslims run the church. Right. We saw what happened when the Hindus run the motels. Can you imagine if they ran the banks? And so, uh, <laughs> and so guys, think about this. I had somebody, you ever hear me, have me say this? The Jews run Hollywood. To which I say, yes, they do. And they, they do the worst job in the world. You know what people are? Traditionally, everybody is their own little self-promoter. That's what Facebook has done. People get to show how wonderful they are. Uh, their hymn, their favorite hymn is, How great I am, how great I am. <clears throat> and, and you promote yourself. So the Jews run Hollywood. Now, would somebody explain to me if the Jews have been run Hollywood from day one? And they have that the religion that they exalt isn't Judaism, it's Roman Catholicism. Why did you have, uh, uh, who was it, uh, Bing Crosby, uh, Pat O'Brien, you remember all the guys that played some kind of a Catholic priest, some heart-wrenching Roman Catholic, why didn't the Jews make the, make the guy that everybody loved a rabbi? Wouldn't it have been to their advantage to make people like Jews? Maybe no one will kill them. And so, yeah, they run Hollywood. They just didn't do a very good job of it because when they got done re with Hollywood, everybody thought we were a Catholic country. 
So if you want your country blessed, let them run it. That's what he said. He said, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And you know our history, that where we bless Israel, God blesses us. So this Abrahamic covenant, God says, if you do this, that's it. Or he didn't say if that, if the Abrahamic covenant, he said, I am going to bless you. And that's it. There's no condition on that. Now, what happens to this covenant? Look at chapter 17. Obviously, Abraham has got to pass off the scene. And the covenant's got to go to somebody. <clears throat> and it goes to Isaac. You say, how do you know? I read my Bible. Now, you know the story. Uh, you know how, how um, Abraham uh, had Isaac. His wife said, uh, go in under my, my handmaid, Hagar, and have a child because I can't have a child. Uh, and so he has Isaac. Uh, and, and the Lord, he's not going to bless Isaac or, or Ishmael. He has Ishmael. And he's not going to bless Ishmael. Uh, and and look, what, look what Abraham says in verse 18. Chapter 17, verse 18. He is 90, uh, he's 99, and she's 90. And Abraham said unto God, verse 18, Oh, that Ishmael would live before thee. He's saying, I wish you would take this covenant you've given me. I wish you would acknowledge is, uh, Ishmael as my son. I wish you would give this covenant and pass it on to Ishmael. Look what the Lord says. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and he will multiply, uh, will multiply him exceedingly, and he will cut off a lot of people's head. Oh, oh, and I will uh, make him a great nation, look at verse 21, but my covenant will I establish. Does anybody see an if? Does anybody see it? If then? No, because this is an unconditional covenant. Uh, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the year. So that covenant goes from Abraham to Isaac. Now, there's something you better, you better pay close attention to. There's a word there in verse 19 that really, really interests you. Your salvation hangs on this word. Look at verse 19. Uh, but God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for a what? An, a what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should have everlasting life. All right. He gave you everlasting life. He gave Israel an everlasting covenant. If God takes that covenant away from them, then what makes you think your everlasting covenant's any good? Did you ever stop and think about this? Your, our salvation is an, is, is an unconditional covenant. Oh yeah, you have to pray. But it's not this, if you'll pray and then keep the Ten Commandments and get baptized and speak in tongues and do this and try to be good all your life, then, then I'll do this. There's no conditions other than asking for eternal life, right? We have an unconditional, everlasting covenant with God. Now, you say, well, it's still an everlasting covenant. God just took it away from them and gave it to us as New Testament Jews. Really? Okay, then can he take your everlasting life away from you and give it to somebody else? If he can do it with them, if that's the precedent, don't tell me he can't do it with you. You know, I, uh, we've been on the road for 31 years. One of the things we always, always, always have with us, we only need them two times, fire extinguisher. Oh, man, when you live, in, when you live on the road, you want to keep a fire extinguisher. Right. First time I used my fire extinguisher wasn't even for me. It was for some trucker. I walked out, pulled in his parking lot. There's in front of his truck's on fire, grabbed my fire extinguisher, went out there and hosed it down. You know what I did? The very next day, I bought a fire extinguisher. The second time, my truck caught fire. You say, I, I mean, I, I walked out of this office. I, I pulled into this, this, uh, uh, this RV park, and it was kind of a circular driveway. I pulled up, walked in there, and, and uh, got, got settled in. And as I walked out, I can't even see my truck, but behind my RV, I see black smoke going up. I go, why is my RV smoking? I walked around there. The front tires on my pickup truck are on fire. And you say, well, you got a fire extinguisher. That's, you better believe I do. And I don't trust that fire extinguisher 
any farther than I can throw it, I could probably throw it away. I trust the Lord. And when I saw that fire, you know what I said? I said, God, I got a fire extinguisher, but that don't mean this fire. I mean, instantaneously, instantaneously, I said, God, if I've got a fire extinguisher, that doesn't mean I'm going to be able to put this fire out. And if I don't put this fire out, this whole rig has gone up. So I said, it's not the fire extinguisher that I'm trusting. It is you that I'm trusting. And I ran, I grabbed that fire extinguisher and I put that fire out. And, and while I was doing it, what I was trying to figure out is how to pull the pin, drop the chains and yank that, that RV out from underneath that truck if I had to. But guys always had a fire extinguisher. Now, think about this. If you have everlasting life, do you have it? Okay, think about this. You never used it. You never used it. It's like a fire extinguisher you never use. You're still running on what you got when the doctor held you upside down, slapped you on the backside. You won't use your everlasting life until you breathe your last. Isn't that true? So, so isn't that amazing? You have this ever. Some of you have been, how many have been saved, saved over 40 years? Okay, you've been saved over 40 years. Would it be something if God took it away now? It's like you have this fire extinguisher for 40 years and never use it, and one day somebody says, yeah, you don't need this anymore, we're taking it to give it to somebody else, and the next day your house burns down because you didn't have the fire extinguisher. Guys, it's nice to have everlasting life, but we're going to use it when we die. So this is an everlasting covenant. If the word everlasting, the covenant with Israel, if the covenant with Israel, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if that covenant, that's not with New Testament Christians who became Jews somehow, if that covenant, if everlasting does not mean everlasting, then you can't prove that everlasting means everlasting about your eternal life. Right. So the covenant unconditionally goes from Abraham to Isaac. Who's next? Now, you know the things I tell guys, I, I, I told them this morning, I, and I know this is going uh, to sound simplistic, but I, I believe trimple, simp, uh, truth is simple. Play fair. Don't cheat. Don't cheat. You know, you, you kind of hedge your bet, you cheat, you find some way to cheat. Take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 27. Now, in Genesis chapter 27, <clears throat> here's what Isaac says. Isaac says to Esau, I want you to go kill me some venison. Go kill me some venison and, I'll, and feed me. You do that, I will bless you. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, see, he's going to give away the Abrahamic covenant to the wrong son. Mind your own business. Who are you? Just let the man alone. He wants to bless his son. Now, I do point this out. You know, the Bible says that, that what Jacob did is he, cut, he, he killed a, 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 a lamb and then they, they you, you know, your pastor here, he goes out and shoots him and guts him immediately. Could you imagine you just killed this lamb and you skin it and take the skins and slap them on your arm? That is gross to me. But that's what, ooh, can you imagine Jacob's going, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and, and then the son, and, and it really tells you something about Esau, because when, when, when Isaac said, yep, that's Esau, <laughs> I killed that lamb, put it on my head. But, um, and so what happens? Jacob steals that blessing from his brother Esau, correct? Don't you dare, don't you dare say, well, he had to do it because, but, because Abraham was going to give the covenant to Esau. All right, let me ask you this. Esau said, to, uh, or, or uh, Isaac said to Esau, feed me and I'll give you a blessing. And Jacob did that and got the blessing and, and deceived his father, right? But it wasn't the Abrahamic blessing. You'd think there might have been a little tension. I mean, when, once, once he, uh, Isaac realized what Jacob had done, had fooled him, deceived him, what do you think the next time they saw each other was like? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Let me touch your arm here, Isaac. Let me touch your arm here, Jacob. He's, yeah, oh, yeah, that doesn't feel like Esau anymore. I mean... Think there might be a little tension? Well, look what happens next time they come in contact. Chapter 28. In Genesis chapter 28, look what it says. 
Verse 1, And Isaac called Jacob, and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, my, thy uh, mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother, and God Almighty bless thee. Didn't he just bless him? Wouldn't you think this? Do you remember Esau said, Don't you have some kind of blessing left for me? And he did give him a blessing. He had another one in the holster he never told Esau about. He had one in the, in the family safe he never told Esau about because it wasn't for Esau. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Watch and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art, art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham. So, in Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 28, that passes in verses 3 and 4, that Abrahamic covenant passes on to Jacob. Now, somebody's going to go, yeah, but, but that's to Jacob the man. Uh, it's not guaranteed to Israel. Hmm? Okay, you say so. Just don't read your Bible. Bible's a dangerous book if you believe too much. Because you'll read that book and you'll find out it doesn't back you. Look at Isaiah chapter 55. You know what I love? Uh, could, I give you a, could I give you a statement that you may have made? And I'll tell you, never make it. Never say this. You ever hear anybody say this? You show me where I'm wrong from the Bible, I'll change what I believe. Have you ever said that? You're lying through your teeth. If some Pentecostal guy came and showed you a verse that said, see, that shows you can lose your salvation, you wouldn't go, well, there it is. I endure the end. I, I guess that I can lose my salvation. You know what you're going to say? You go, five more, you go find five or ten more verses that back your side. Right? And so people always go, well, just show me the, from the Bible. You don't have that much character. Haven't you, you ever, you ever deal with somebody and you ask them before you witness to them, you say, before you show them anything in the Bible, you go, do you believe the Bible? Oh, yeah. I mean, you believe this is God's book? I sure do. You believe everything it says? I sure do. Show them salvation by grace. I don't care what you say, I don't believe that. <laughs> and Christians are just the same. Let me tell you what this is a problem. This problem that, that not just Stephen Anderson, but all of the mid-tribbers and all of the replacement theology guys, the problem they have, and so, so too the modern version people. It is not a head problem. It's a heart problem. Because they will see this scripture. Look, you, I wish you could see that video. I think I'm still watching it in my head. It's the funniest thing I ever saw. But the fact is, I am so blessed because the guy, scripture after scripture after scripture last night, and you know what he did? He didn't touch one scripture. Isn't it funny? The bozo, his little puppet, the other day had to say, Gip didn't use much scripture. Well, he couldn't answer what I gave. Had about three times that much last night. I'll have about four times that much uh, tonight and that much again tomorrow. Yep. So, and he will, he will come back with something after his masters who, do, who write the script and pull the strings on him. Right. They'll say, here, Stevie, read this. Be a good boy. We'll treat you good. We'll make you famous. Because right. I'll show you the deal he made with the devil. Yeah. Yeah. I will show you the deal that Stephen Anderson made with the devil. And um, uh, he can't refute it, so all he can do is get a, I told you, we've come to the point now where good video work sp sends the message. So he wants, he wants people to think Sam Gipp's a fool. Hey, I might be a fool, but I'm better than him. That's what I said, I might, be not, I might not be very intelligent. Well then Steve, if you, somebody's, you call a guy not intelligent and he puts you in a box, do you know what that makes you look like? So now you got uh, Isaiah chapter 55, now, let me just show you something. You've seen this verse. Look at verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. That verse is one of the famous verses that we Bible believers go to about God honoring his Bible, correct? Yeah. And, and, and that his word will come to pass. Yes. But that, that interpretation of that verse is very much like, Behold, I stand at the door and knock and want to come in and save you. Because uh, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's not the Lord knocking on the heart's door of a lost man trying to save him. That's the Lord trying to knock on your door while you're watching Dancing with the Stars. And he's trying to have some fellowship. Okay, 
The secondary meaning of this is what we use it for, the Word of God. But do you know what this is a promise of? When he said, my word, shall it, it shall accomplish my purpose. You know what's right before this? God promising to keep Israel. That's what that verse is talking about. He's not only saying, I'm going to keep Israel, but he said, my word. He said, I'm going to tell you I'm going to take care of Israel, and so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. I will take care of Israel, I shall, and it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send. So how do you know? Look at verse 4. And if you notice, that's only seven verses away from what we just read. Look what it says. Verse... Uh, Oh, sorry, verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. You know, he's talking to, he's talking to the nation of Israel. Which means that that covenant, it was given to Abraham unconditionally, it was given to Isaac, uh, un uh, to Isaac un un unconditionally. Don't you think it would have been good, Isaac, to say this to Jacob? You know what, bud? I was going to give you Ab the Abrahamic covenant, but you fooled me, and just for that, I'm going to give it to Esau. But he still didn't do it. It still went to it still went to Jacob. So that Abrahamic covenant came from God. It was given to him unconditionally. It went to Isaac. It's unconditional. It went to Jacob. It's unconditional. And just in case you don't think that's the whole nation of Israel, he said to Israel himself, it is yours. No ifs, ands, or buts. No thens. No, if you do this, I'll, I'll bless you. He said, you got the covenant. Now, he has never taken that covenant from Israel. Anybody that says he has, they better watch themselves because they're lying. They might lose their everlasting life. They just may lose their, their, their salvation. You say, you don't think they can lose their salvation. Well, maybe they can. Now, you say, here's the thing about Israel. Israel did do bad, did they not? Is, you say, yeah, they're doing bad. Yeah. I, I'm not sure they ever had abortion. I, I'm not sure if they let men marry men. Okay. So we're kind of lining up for something. And, and God punishes. What parent here has not punished their child? If you haven't punished your kid, you got a monster. All right? But, so he punished them. Say, so how'd he do it? Uh, how many times you read in the Old Testament, a nation come in and, and beat up on Israel and beat up on Israel? In fact, here's what you see. Israel wanders from God. A nation comes in and beats up on them. They run back to God. Then they wander from God. A nation beats up on them. And God even says, I sent them there to do that to you. You know what I tell, what I tell parents? When our, when our oldest son turned 18, and he, t he flew off to... Uh, Bible College, <clears throat> we happened to be in Philadelphia, and that's the airport that he flew out of, and I can still remember this, I'm watching this Southwest jet take off, you know, and I did not have this remorse. I did not watch my 18-year-old son leave, and they thought, man, I should have spent more time with him. We went on the road when he was 10. I was always, I was close to my boys, and the last 10 years, man, we lived in the same, I mean, we lived in a trailer. You understand, if you live in a trailer, if you do push-ups, you're in three rooms. I used to walk in, I'd say, John, get to your room. He'd go, okay. <laughs> we, had, we had lived, the five of us, in a 31-foot box, okay? And, and it wasn't I have remorse because I didn't spend time with him and should. I spent as much quality time, call it anything you want. My remorse was I didn't realize how fast 18 years went. Then my wife and I were kind of like in shock for the next four years because the next one down was 14 and all we're thinking is, oh, he's going to leave in four years right. and after he left we thought and how soon about you anyway um, <laughs> yeah. but here's what I tell people you, if, you got a, if you got a little baby set them on your lap those little kids right there set them on your lap brother right. set them on your lap as much as you can you know why because they all get big enough where they go I don't want to sit on your lap anymore but here's the thing, now see if this isn't true. Your kid, he'll turn eight, nine, I'm not gonna sit on my dad's lap, I'm not gonna sit on my mom's lap anymore until he gets hurt. And all of a sudden, he wants to be three again. I mean, he's out there fighting, you know, I don't know what they fight now, they can't fight Indians, they're not allowed, they can't even like, fight Muslims. So I probably, he's out there hugging trees and, uh, and, and fighting, uh, you know, uh, some blight from the, for the elm tree, uh, or people that 
people that don't love whales. And he falls down and hurts himself. And buddy, you know what? When they get hurt, they forget all about that. Don't sit on a lap anymore. And so nation, you know what the nation of Israel did? They get away from God and they get hurt and they run back home. And they'd run away, get away from God, and they got hurt. It got so bad, he put them in captivity for 70 years. You say, that's very severe. He's the father. He'd do what he wants. And so he let, com he, he let countries walk on them. He put them in captivity for seven years. In 70 AD, he tore that house down, and it was his house. It was his. Um, in, uh, look, at, look at Romans. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, here's what he says now. Verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Right. Now, notice that. See, th these guys, you know, I've, here's what I've not, I can't understand about the replacement theology. Now, I am not, a, I'm not a buy, I don't buy into it, don't believe any of it. Uh, I told you I think Israel not just was God's chosen people, but they still are. Right. But why couldn't a guy say this? they buy into the first half of the replacement theology. I think God has replaced Israel with us Christians, and I think we are, when God talks about the Jews, that's us. Why, and that's what these guys say. Why can't they do that without buying into the second half, which is everybody that gets into the first half, the second half is they absolutely hate the Jews. Right. Would, you, would you go soul winning with a black t-shirt on with a Palestinian flag that says free Palestine? You say, who did that? Stephen Anderson and all of his thugs. Well, that's balancing the approach. Really? That's balancing the approach? Well, then uh, why don't we say something good about the devil? We need to balance our approach. Why don't we say something good about homosexuality? This is, we're just too negative about homosexuality. Don't you have to balance it? Hey, can I tell you something? God doesn't believe in balance. You can't find God. He believes in moderation. He believes in temperance. I love these people who go, well, God believes in balance. If God believes in balance, then you better go out and get as many rapists, homosexuals, and perverts in this church as you have people who aren't. I can prove from Scripture that God doesn't believe in balance. The Bible, final authority. You remember when he made that temple? And you ever go into a theater and they have a big curtain that goes from that wall to that wall and it comes together? From that wall to the center, it took five panels. From that wall to the center, it took five panels. That's ten panels, right? Ten curtains? Eleven. Five and five would have brought the curtain together, and the scene would have been dead center, and that would have been balance. But God said, I want one side to have five and one to have six, so that when they close, this one over closes over that, it's off center. But that way, because every, every, a curtain that comes together, doesn't it sometimes part and you can see past it? God didn't want anybody looking into the Holy Holies. In the name of holiness, God will forego balance. In the name of holiness, God will forego balance. Keep that in mind. When you said balance, 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 there's no balance. God says this is how it is, and that's how it is. When I think, I want to get my say in, you don't count. And, and uh, over history, nations have shown Israel no mercy whatsoever. Isn't that true? Right. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. This isn't, uh, this isn't this list. This is another list. Uh, guys, I tell people again, I tell, I tell you guys all the time, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. And the only reason I tell you that really is, why don't you read your Bible? And if you read your Bible, sometimes you just see stuff that stands out, and I have no idea why it stands out. I really don't. I don't understand. I don't understand why it stands out. Uh, um, I, I'll show you something. Look at. Uh, I showed him today. Look at uh, Matthew chapter twenty-eight. Matthew chapter twenty-eight. No, oh, twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Uh, there's just an odd thing that happens in Matthew chapter 27. I see this nowhere else in another chapter in Scripture. And when I get done showing this, do you know what somebody's going to say? Yawn. So what's that about? To which I'm going to say, oh no. But we're not talking about anything deep theological. But it's this. 
You, you look at verse 1, and starting there, we're going to go through, not every verse, watch the words that for some reason start with the letter S. Okay, look at verse 3. Uh, toward the end of it, it says, uh, brought again the 30 pieces of silver. Verse 4, saying, I have sinned. Verse 11, and Jesus stood. Uh, verse 19, very end of it, for I have suffered many things uh, this day in a dream because of him. Look at um, verse 26. And he scourged Jesus. Verse 27. Very, the very, and then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus. Verse 28. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. 30. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. Verse 32. A man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Last verse, our last word in verse 33, place of a skull. 35, toward the end, uh, that which was spoken by the prophet. 36, and sitting down, they watched him there. 37, and set up over his head. 30, uh, 42, he saved others. 43, I am the son of God. 44, very end of it, cast the same in his teeth. 45, now from the sixth hour, 47, some of them that stood, 48, and straightway, one of them ran and took a sponge, 49, end of it, see if Elias will come to save him, 52, many, many bodies of the saints which slept, verse 54, very last words of it, son of God, 60, uh, roll a great stone to the door of the sepulcher. 61, Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Talk about the angels. Uh, 63, saying, sir. 64, made sure until the third day, lest his disciples uh, come by night and steal him. And watch the very, look at the very last verse. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. They say, well, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know it means anything. But you know, if you read your Bible, sometimes you just find something. Maybe that is a, maybe that is a, uh, maybe that is a prophecy for you people to be aware and people to look out that maybe God is going to send you some great preacher whose name begins with S. <laughs> well, I was just supposing. Anyway, but, but here, that's what I'm saying, guys. I just, if you just read your Bible, that may not, that, I don't know what that, I don't know it means anything. And it may mean nothing to you, but I sure liked it. Uh, I'll show you something. Look at Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4. Now I tell people, I said, I can't take a hint. You ever, you ever have somebody say something over and over, and, you, and, you're not, and then you get away and you go, oh, they were trying to tell us to leave. And let's see, uh, let's see if, if you can find out the hint that God is trying to get across here. You know the story. Uh, Ruth's husband died. She goes back to Judah with her, with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Boaz, the rich old guy, falls in love with this young girl. It says this, then went Boaz up to the gate. He wants to marry her. But the protocols of Israel make him second in line behind another kinsman. This guy's got first dibs. And if he says, I want Ruth, Boaz is out. So he's got to check with this guy to see what his intentions are. Are you going to marry Ruth? Yes. Okay. If he says no, Boaz is the next guy up. Then went Boaz up to the gate uh, and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, uh, unto whom he said, Lo, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again and out of the country of Moab, selleth, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee. Hey, guys, 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 guys. 400-year-old book. Out of date with the times. And anybody here, you guys go onto eBay and you go onto the internet and you want to sell something, what do you do? King James Word. From that day to this, when we want to sell something, we say, I'm going to advertise it. My, how out of date your King James Bible is. 
And I thought to advertise these saying, buy it. Now watch, see if you can, see if you can pick up the hint that God is trying to get across here. Buy it before the inhabitants uh, and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there be none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. <laughs> redeem it, redeem it, redeem it, redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. <laughs> Isn't that something? Look at verse 6. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in former times in Israel concerning redeeming. I mean, redeem, redeem, redeem. You think I was trying to get something across? Yeah, you know, I was telling this morning, and, and, and I am glad. If you're saved, I'm glad. I hope you're redeemed. Now, I am not starting a new doctrine. Steve, not starting a new doctrine. You got redeemed when you got saved. But here's what I mean when I talk about it. I say this, it's good to be saved, it's better to be ruined. Uh, I was talking to this guy that got saved. You know, sometimes you get saved. Somebody shows up right after that with a list and says, now that you're saved, uh, you can't do this, can't do this. No more happiness, no more smiling, no more fun, no more laughter. You're a Christian now and a Baptist. Um, uh, I was talking to this guy and he said, he said, I got saved. Folks, like he did every Monday night. But he's this guy that steals a grocery cart comes by and picks it up and says, because it's And he said, I think I can redeem this guy. I was telling Masson City Jail wall when I was 14 years old, and they tore it down. In 68, he said, we're moving the tool crib, and I pulled these shelves, unbolted these shelves from the wall, and there on the wall in great big letters it said, Sam Gipp. I said, I remember. The tool crib, they were moving it from upstairs to downstairs. I said, I was in charge of the tool crib when we moved it from downstairs to upstairs. I mean, is this not government work? Okay, move it upstairs. Okay, move it downstairs. Okay, move it upstairs. Okay, move it downstairs. And, um, and I said, before I bolted those shelves to the wall, I thought, I'll sign the wall. I'll be long gone before they find out. And, and my, my high school, not understanding the value of that name, <laughs> painted over it. You know, I still got my name on the wall of one public building in my hometown. I got my name on the wall of one public building. My books are in the library shelf. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of, a, it's impre it, it, it amazes me. It really shocks some of my English teachers. Right. Every now and then, I think one of my old teachers, they're always coming from the same part, they hear him going, 
they hear, the, the librarian hears somebody go, it can't be, <laughs> and they find him dead with a copy of uh, Fight On in their hands. But let me explain this. The guy that signed the jail cell wall at 14 and the high school wall at 18 never could have got a job, could, could have got a book on that wall, on that library shelf. Say what happened. He got saved, got redeemed. Guys, when redeemed is when God comes along, sees that empty old can, says, I see a value in you, buddy. Isn't it good that God knows he saves you? He sees a value in you. So he's saying it here. Redeem, 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 redeem. Hey, think about this. It's a whole other sermon, but but if she got married and lived happily ever after, and I know we always say that uh, Orpa probably married a doper and he beat her, but you know, maybe she married a good Moabite and he loved her and was just as good to her as Moab, as, as Boaz was to Ruth. But even if she did, she never understood redemption. She was with her own people, the Moabites. This is a Moabite. Don't you know what it must have been like for Ruth to go downtown when she was just the daughter-in-law of Naomi and said, Moabite. I had that first. And then she marries Boaz. Oh, Mrs. Boaz. You know, I got this new cloth in. I know it's your favorite. I've been holding it back. Not letting anybody else get it. I bet she's walking there going, what is going on? Man, I go preach someplace and I see my name on a marquee and I go, what is going on? Redeemed. So, I just make a, 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 I'm reading my Bible. In fact, I was reading this uh, on the way home from the last meeting uh, with this message in mind. I'm reading my Bible and um, I'm reading Isaiah and in Jeremiah on a plane and I started writing stuff down. And, and I call this the R words. Okay? Say, what do you mean? Well, re, 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 re. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about words that start with R like this. God is called Israel's Redeemer. If you're writing things down, now these, you will not get this sheet. So if you want to write references down, write these references down. We'll pass those sheets out in a minute. But in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14, it says, Fear not, the, listen carefully, Fear not, thou worm, Jacob. Oh, I like that. Yeah, you want to be a Jew? Why don't you be a worm? That's what you need to remember. You're just a worm. That's why I don't have a pride problem. I know what I am. You know what I am? I am deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. That book defines me that way. And he defines you that way. And it defines all the, all the mid-tribbers, and it defines all the replacement theology. There's not a person on this earth that isn't a definition of them and a description of them. Isn't that true? You know what you need to do next time you're looking in a mirror and you're just so impressed with what you see, just go, you worm. And that will help you. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something to see some movie star just about to go out on a stage and, he go, and goes, now remember, you're a worm. He called me a worm. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and you men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 43, 14, thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sakes have I set uh, to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry uh, is in the ships. So there's Redeemer. He is their Redeemer, is he not? But then there's this word itself, redeem. Now, here's what you've got to keep in mind. Whoops on this word redeem. Sometimes it is redeem and sometimes it is redeemed past tense. The reason I put that on the end is because God says you will read in your Bible and you will see the word redeemed past tense when he's talking about bringing them out of, out of Egypt. Well I'm going to talk about, he's, he'll say I redeemed you from Egypt then he looks to the future and says, I will redeem you. The reason I'm showing you this is because a dishonest Bible teacher, let's say somewhere in Phoenix, might say, well, when the Bible says it talks about Israel being redeemed, it's always talking about past tense. That would be another wonderful, consistent lie. Okay? Like this. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 12. And they shall, does that sound like past tense? And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out a, a city not forsaken. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 21. And I, I will, guys, 
Keep this in mind. Watch these two words when it talks about Israel. You're going to see these two words more than any two words. I shall. God's saying it. I will. And when the, de when the devil says I will, that ain't going to happen. When God says I will, you can bet your soul on it. Didn't he say, if you'll, if you'll trust my son, I'll save you? You can trust him. Um, 1521, Jeremiah, I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Micah chapter 4, verse 10, be in pain and labor uh, to go forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, thou shalt, uh, thou shalt dwell in the field, thou shalt go even to Babylon, uh, there shalt thou be delivered, there the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. He's saying, Israel, you're going to go to Babylon, they're going to take you captive, but from there I shall redeem you. Now here's, a, you say, well that's talking about 1948. Well if it is, then we haven't replaced the Jews. Right? If, if anybody in replacement theology acknowledges that that happened on May 14th, 1948, May 14th, 1948 was the day, the day the modern state of Israel came into existence. If any of those replacement guys claim, well, that is God bringing Israel out of the land, I thought God replaced, us, replaced them with us. What, he did that right after 1948? I'd like to see that in the Bible. Verse uh, Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed be the, the God of Israel, for he hath uh, visited and redeemed his people. Um, now, look at, now look at verse 24, 21. But we trusted that it had been, him, be, be, had been he uh, which should have redeemed Israel, talking about future, uh, and beside all this, uh, today is the third day since these uh, things were done. Let me, let me tell you something that I said years ago. And there's really nothing wrong with it, but um, uh, Stephen Anderson thought he had some, so, something and he was going to make a big deal out of it and it's falling on his face because everything he does falls on its face. I said this. Um, I believe that Jesus is Christ the Lord. Okay? I believe that. Now, there is, a, there is a broad definition of this word, Messiah. And that broad definition very simply is the Christ. Well then, if the Messiah is just the Christ, then I say Jesus is my Messiah. But I made a statement, I said he's not my Messiah. Now, you know what the, you know what the word Messiah means? Messiah means deliverer. Christ means anointed. Do you know that Jesus isn't called Christ? He's called the Lord's Christ. You know why? Remember the anointed cherub that covereth? Anointed? The devil is a Christ. He's the anti-Christ. All right? And so Christ is the anointed, and as Christ... I think that, that, that encompasses a whole bunch of stuff, and one of those in, in Christ, in his duties, is being the Messiah. But Messiah is for Israel to be delivered. God is going to send them a Messiah, a deliverer. Okay, if he's going to deliver Israel, who's been giving Israel a hard time over the centuries? Huh? Gentiles. Well, if he's, you can't find an Old Testament verse where he said to the Gentiles, I'm going to send you a deliverer. Well, if he's going to send Gentiles to deliver, who are they going to be delivered from? <laughs> Jews. Now, you can find an Old Testament verse, you can find many that says the Gentiles will be blessed through Israel. The Gentiles will come to Israel. And we got in, did we not? Sure. We got into a Jewish system. And so he had me saying, Jesus wasn't, um, isn't my Messiah. The Messiah was not sent to the Gentiles, the Messiah was sent to Israel. And so he made a big deal of that because he doesn't know any Bible. He doesn't know anything because somebody else does his work for him. So, but I said this. I said, if, if, and they said, he went and said, 
Messiah means Christ. Sam Gipps denying that Jesus is Christ. You know what he did? He took a 20 second sound bite out of a message that I had where I said, Jesus is not my Messiah. But I told you, we're in the age when camera and sound bites, that's what everybody looks at. I'm gonna give you a challenge. Now, now guys, uh, I have some sermons that are on uh, the authority of the King James Bible. If you said, hey Gip, show me why somebody when they get saved, they ought to get baptized right after they get saved. I would say, well don't look at my stuff on the King James Bible. Look on one, I got one on the ordinances and that tells you about baptism. Well, hey, Gip, I'm interested in eternal security. Okay, then you better find one that I have on eternal security. Well, I want something on the King James Bible. Then go find one I've got on the King James Bible. Your pastor probably has sermons that have particular subjects. And if, you, if he said, if you said, Pastor, I need some information on this, what did you preach about it? He'd tell you to go to a particular sermon that had that information in it, right? All right, I'm going to tell you which sermon to go to on this. Anything I ever preached anywhere. Now, you think you can find one of those? And see if any sermon, I don't have to say go to a particular one, go to any sermon I ever preached and see if I don't say Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ the Lord. I have been calling him Jesus Christ the Lord since I got saved. Actually before I got saved, but I'm, I claim him as Christ the Lord. So this guy has taken 20, 20 seconds, then reinterpreted it to try to make it look like I don't believe Jesus is Christ because he can't refute this material. So he's got to kill the messenger because the message is killing him. And he's an enemy of this book because it is the book that is showing where he's wrong. And if you're a little puppet and a spy, that's your problem. All right? And if, if me saying something bad about him, you must worship him. You know why? Because if somebody says something ugly about Allah, I say amen. If somebody says something about God, God, the God of the Bible, I'll get in your face. Because you mess with my God, I'll mess with you. Right. You say some. you tell me that the NIV's got mistakes in it, I'll say amen. You tell me this book's got mistakes in it, I'll come after you. Right. Yeah. So if I say something about Stephen Anderson and it upsets you, yeah. what's the matter? Somebody step on your God? Right. Right. I'll do more than step on him. And considering I'm not very intelligent, yeah. he's in trouble. Oh, here's another word. So, I just want to point out, you're going to see redeemed, past tense, talking about coming out of Egypt. Then you're going to see redeem, and it'll always be future. He's going to redeem them again. Here's another word used to, uh, with Israel. Residue. You know, I don't know what your water is like. Down in Boise, the water's got a lot of minerals in it. And I get this car, and I wash this car, and you got you got to towel them off, or or the it you know it dries all that minerals on there. And uh, I was washing my car the other day, and this truck driver comes over to look at my car, and so I got to stop. And it's I mean I know there's like one percent humidity. You could pour water on the ground. I think before it hits the ground, it'll evaporate. It just everything dries real quick. So this guy's talking to me. And my car's all water spotted, and then the water's dry, and I got these water spots, residue, all over the car. So I gotta wash it again. I'm washing it again, somebody else comes by. <sighs> and it gets another set. And I'm, I'm washing it the second time, or the third time, and I said, if anybody else comes by, they can get out of their car and talk to me, because I'm washing this car. And my pastor drove up and sat in his truck, and I said, hi, pastor. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> And, it got, it got, and I'm telling you, I washed that car four times. I've still got some residue on the windshield. Residue's hard to get rid of. So is Israel. They actually got to the point where they made maps and, and globes that didn't have the nation of Israel on them. And now they got to put it on, don't they? What does he say about residue? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 5. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty under the residue of his people. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 9. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding <coughs> of nettles and salt, salt pits and a perpetual desolation. Do, do you know what he's going to do to Moab and Ammon? You know he never says that, a perpetual desolation, and uses Israel as a subject? 
The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. So, when God talks about Israel, he says, I'm their redeemer. I'm going to redeem them. There's going to be residue. And he said, there's going to be a remnant, right? Like this. And watch how many times shall, shall, will, shall, shall. Isaiah chapter 20, or chapter 10, verse 20, 21 and 23, and it shall come to pass, verse 20, in that day that the remnant of Israel, and such as are escaped to the house of Jacob, of the house of Jacob, not a bunch of saved Gentiles, shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Verse 21, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob unto the mighty God, Verse 23, for the Lord God of, it, of, of hosts uh, shall make a consumption uh, even determined in the midst of the land. Isaiah 11, 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand against again the second time to recover. Oh, that's a nice word. Recover. Recover the remnant. All them are words. And somebody say, oh, that doesn't mean anything. It means something if you're a Jew means something if you don't like them and want to pretend that God's done with them. Time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from, from Egypt, Paphros, uh, and, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and, from, and uh, Hamath. Uh, verse 16, and there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people. Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 32, out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of, the Mount, out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 3, and I will gather the remnant of my flock. Say, why a remnant? Because a bunch of them got hammered, guys. They left God, and God hammered them. And now he's got a remnant. But he's got the remnant, and the remnant's going to get blessed. So how do you know? Because that's what God said. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them. All right, are there Jews in New York? Then that scripture has not been fulfilled. Right? Are there Jews in France? Are there Jews in, I probably still some Jews in Germany. I bet there's Jews all over the country, all over the world. Then he hasn't fulfilled that scripture yet. So that's a scripture that is future. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. They say, well, that's, uh, that's 1948. Okay, then they're going to be fruitful and increase. I have never found anybody that believes in replacement theology that says, We've been re we replace Israel, and they're, but they're not hostile with Israel. Why don't they say, I'm happy for the Jews, I don't dislike them. Why do you have to wear a Muslim flag, the people that are cutting off Jews' heads and killing them, why would you wear that flag on your chest? Would anybody in this room go soul winning with a Muslim flag on their chest? Micah chapter 2, verse 12, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I'll put them together as the sheep of Bozrah, as the flock in the midst, in the midst of their fold. Uh, and they shall make a great noise by reason of the multitude of men. Micah chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord. Verse 8. The remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people. Zephaniah, uh, we just saw that in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 9. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 13. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. They shall be freed, uh, they shall be, I'm sorry, fed. Uh, they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Is that true today? Are the Jews afraid today? They got good reason to be afraid, do they not? Listen, if the Jews aren't afraid, how come every Jewish, Jewish household has a secure room they can go in? How come, how come when we're over there in Israel, we're watching a bunch of high school kids go visiting places, and the girls are carrying M16s? Because they're afraid. I ain't a boy on a place that that girl's afraid of. Um, how about this word? Restore. Guys, God speaks very plainly, does he not? 
He speaks very plainly. You know what the things about Jesus Christ was? What they say? He, he, he speaks with authority. He doesn't speak as, a, as the scribes and Pharisees. And you know who heard him gladly? The common man heard him gladly. Say, why are you glad about that? I'm a common man. God has plainly said, I'm their redeemer. I will redeem them. There will be a residue. There will be a remnant. I will Here's what it says, restore, for I will restore health unto thee and will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast. Oh, isn't that funny? Somebody called Israel an outcast. Somebody said that Israel was cast out. That's exactly what the, what the replacement theology people say. Uh, <clears throat> called an outcast saying, this is Zion whom no man seeketh after. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. How about this one? Repair. Don't you guys say, man, I got to repair my, my fellowship with... But, you know, I, I had a problem with my pastor. I've got to repair my fellowship or my relationship. I had a problem with my son, problem with my dad. I've got to repair it. Isaiah 61, 4, and they shall uh, build the old waste. It's always shall. Look how many times it is shall. They shall build the old waste. They shall raise up uh, the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. How about this one? Refrain. Refrain. Somebody's going to stop you. How's this? Isaiah chapter 48, verse 9. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and, my pray, and, my pray, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. If he says to Israel, I'm, I'm refraining so I don't cut you off, and somebody says God did cut them off, well, you better decide today which one you're going to believe. And like I said, if, somebody, if God says, I'm not going to cut you off, and somebody else says, God, cut them off, say, do this. Anybody tells you God cut the Jews off, go like this. Say, go like this. And when they do this, go, no nail holes. And if you don't have nail holes in your hands, you can't override God. How about this one? Return. Isaiah chapter 10, we saw these, 21 and 22, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Uh, 22, for though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return, the consumption degree, decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Isaiah 44, uh, 42, verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud my, thy, thy, thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my words be, my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I, I, I please, and it shall, shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Those words, though we use them for the Bible, when he said it's going to do what I said, what he said was, I'm going to restore Israel. Isaiah 30, 10, which say to the seers, go uh, see not to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, uh, oh, speak us unto smooth things, uh, prophesy deceits. I have that in there for, I have no idea why I have that in there. Uh, Isaiah, well, I'm not very intelligent. Isaiah 33, verse 7, Behold, their valiant ones shall cry without, the ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. Uh, look at verse uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 33, and verse 26. Then will I cast away the seed of Jacob uh, and David my servant. Say when? so that I will, I will uh, not take any of his seed to be rulers uh, over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their capti captivity to return and have mercy on them. So he says he's going to take it away. Wait till you see why. Wait till you see what it takes for God to, to get rid of Israel. Jeremiah 46, verse 27. For, uh, Fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not deceived, O Israel, uh, for behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. That's not happened yet. That's prophetic. Look here. Look here. Redeem, 
Re Redeemer, redeemed, residue, remnant, restore, repair, refrain, return. Oh, wait a minute. But we're talking about replace. Isn't that it? Do this on your own. Punch replace into your Bible. Your electric Bible. Punch replace in. It isn't even in the Bible. Why wouldn't a plain talking God at least one time say, I'm going to replace you? Well, he's replaced Israel with us. Why would you use a word God never used in his book? God never said replace. He said return. He said refrain. He said repair. He said restore. He said there'll be a remnant. He said there'll be a residue. He said he'd redeem them. He said he's their redeemer. Why didn't God say replace one time? How'd you get a doctrine? You can't even find the word in the Bible. Well, like they say, I got that out of the Bible. You sure did because it's never in there. All right, point two. <laughs> point two. I want to talk to you about this restoration. Uh, can we have some guys pass these out? And look, guys, I tend to be long. And please come back tomorrow night because tomorrow night I'll, I'll speak expressly about him. But if I, if I go too long and that bothers you, here's what you do. Just don't come back Thursday night. <laughs> See, I'm a very reasonable person. Not very intelligent, but I'm very reasonable. Very reasonable. Now, looking at this restoration of Israel. We saw the other day that, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. That um, Israel is the good olive tree. We are the wild olive branch. We were grafted into the good olive tree. Isn't that true? I want you to look at a couple of things before we go to that sheet. We're not going to that sheet yet. But uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'll show you what's wrong with Israel today. But what I'm going to show you, you already knew. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You know the story. Moses went up on the mount with God. And he didn't realize it, but while he was up there, when he came down, he glowed. Right? And so they couldn't face him because of the glow, so they put a veil between them and Moses because they couldn't take that. And so the veil was between them and Moses. Here's their problem now. Look at verse um, 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until the day... Uh, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Well, isn't that funny? God believes in dispensations. Because God believes there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. I, maybe some of these guys need to break fellowship with God. Maybe they need to tell God he's not saved because he's a dispensationalist. In the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So today, the Jews, you know what it is? They can't see it. Say why? There's a veil. That's what their problem is. They can't see it. Uh, look at chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. And this is that verse that I mentioned to you. The other day, verse 32, give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. So a person who is a Jew, when they get saved, they are no longer a Jew, they are the church of God. When a, when a Gentile gets saved, they don't become a Jew, they become part of the church of God also. Now, that is biblical fact and doctrine. But Paul himself referred to himself nationally as a Jew, just like we can genetically refer to ourselves as Gentiles. But the fact is that when you got saved, God doesn't see you. You know, I see a bunch of Gentiles getting into this uh, Masonic, Messianic Christianity, and they're dancing around with a bunch of Jewish songs. And I thought, why do you think you're going to do something you never did when the Jews don't even have to do that anymore? But everybody wants to be religious about something. But there are no Jews or Gentiles in Christ. We are the church of God. I think you need to change the name of this church. Northwest Bible Church of God. Um, 
and we are spiritual children of Abraham, but we are still Jews. Now, this sheet of paper, this sheet of paper, these sheets of paper, look at what it says. As far as restoration, um, for I would not, brethren, verse, uh, Romans chapter uh, 11, first page, uh, verse 25, <clears throat> I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. And that is the problem. These guys are wise. They're conceited. Uh, if you watch this guy, you never saw anybody love himself more than that guy other than maybe Barack Obama and Cassius Clay. Really, those two guys loved, each, loved themselves, and, and, and this guy loves himself. That blindness in part uh, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Okay? Um, the next one down, Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 3. Look at verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. But, but guys, they see the Jews are ignorant of God's righteousness. How many of you were ignorant of God's righteousness until somebody showed it to you? I was ignorant of it for 20 years. And I had religion. Somebody showed me. They expounded unto me the way of God more perfectly. And I got saved. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, why would you hate somebody who is in ignorance? When isn't that our motive for sending missionaries? And going about to establish their own righteousness. Are the Jews the only ones that do that? Every church on every corner that is not a gospel preaching church is a testimony to that. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Um, look at Romans chapter 11 verse 1. I say, God hath, hath God cast away his people? Now that's Paul... Plainly asking questions. See, you've got Gip trying to convince you that God hasn't thrown Israel away. If you don't like Gip, try Paul. And look what Paul says. Then say I, have God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And he said that after he was saved. But he said, God has not cast away his people. The apostle Paul said, God never cast away the Jews. If somebody says God cast away the Jews, then they, are, they, are, they put themselves higher than the apostle Paul. They actually put themselves higher than God. Uh, uh, down at the bottom, number three. <clears throat> Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30, verses one through five. Uh, let's look on the back, verse top, very top. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. Uh, for any of thine, uh, if any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee. You know the amazing thing about this is the Bible doesn't say he's going to get rid of the Jews. The Bible keeps saying over and over and over I'm going to keep them. Verse 5. And the Lord thy God will, will bring thee into the land which thy fathers have possessed. All right? My kin are Romanian. They never possessed the land of Israel. But the people he's talking to, their, their fathers possessed the land of Israel. Who could they be? They're Jews. Uh, number five down there. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 3, and then 6 and 7. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I've driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, uh, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Now you say, well, that's 1948. Okay. But if you say it's 1948, it proves God has not cast them off. It proves he's still dealing with them. Right. And you've surrendered the point. Amen. But look at this. Six, in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. Now, these guys that say, I'm, I'm saved, I'm a spiritual Jew. Well, which are you, from the tribe of Judah? Or you, you tribe from Israel or from Judah? Because there he's talking to Judah and Israel. In fact, time again, he says, of the seed of Abraham, of the seed of Judah. That's not spiritual, guys. That's physical. So if you're a spiritual Jew, are you a Jew from, from Israel or from Judah? Maybe they'll come up with a new doctrine before they make a video tomorrow. <laughs> and, in, and in his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. But the Lord liveth, which brought uh, up 
up and which uh, led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. What that's referring to is this. Today, the greatest feat that God, God uh, achieved in the history of Israel was their deliverance out of Egypt. Even in the Gulf Wars and, and in the six, six Day War and in Yom Kippur, and God has worked miraculously, but the greatest miracle in the history of Israel was God delivering them from Egypt, correct? And so, so Israel says, he is the God that delivered us from, from Egypt. And that is what God is known as. And what he's saying here, read the passage yourself. He said, in the future, I won't be, you won't call me, you won't think I'm great because I'm the God that led you out of Egypt. You'll think I'm great because I brought you out of, the, all, of, out of all of the countries around the world that you were scattered. He said, you won't know me as the God that brought you out of Egypt, but the Lord liveth with brought, brought up that which uh, led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. That's what God's going to be famous for. He's going to be famous not just for having brought them out of Egypt. That's old stuff. He's going to be famous for the greatest act, which is bringing them from all around the world back to the nation of Israel. Number six, Jeremiah chapter 30, verses one through 11. Look at verse three. And lo, the days come, there it is, prophetic again, saith the Lord, I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers. God never gave that land to your fathers. I don't care where you came from, unless you were born a Jew, your Jewish lineage, your history goes to a piece of dirt and it's not, it's not the holy land. So that can't, you don't spiritualize that. It's literal. Uh, and they shall possess it. Verse 4, and these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Uh, look on page 3, look at verse 7. Alas, for, the, uh, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Uh, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So even if this guy says, well, see, uh, it, the Jews are going to get it, and God's going to save them. For it shall come to pass in that day, look what it says uh, in the next verse, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. Guys, over and over and over is prophecy toward Israel. Verse 9, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king. When was David your king? See, if I say David's never been my king, that's no different than saying God never sent the Gentiles a Messiah. David's never been your king. The people he's talking to, David was their king. You know why? Because he's talking to Jews. And most even, I wouldn't doubt there's a 12-year-old in here that can understand it. Just some 12-year-olds. Maybe the Arizona desert burns their brains, but uh, they can't figure it out. Verse 10, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee. Over and over, I told you, watch for the words, I shall, I will, I will, I shall. God keeps talking prophetically about Israel. Guys, there is more prophecy about Israel than than. Uh, being restored than probably any subject, probably even more than salvation by grace. Put that in your next video, Stevie. Gibbs said the Israel is going to get restored even more than salvation by grace. Hey, I got enough on salvation by grace. I got saved. But over and again, he talks about restoring Israel. Um, I will save thee, verse 10, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their cap, thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in, in, in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. That is not now, that has got to be future. Next verse, 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, not to replace thee, not to cast thee off, not to get disowned thee. I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations whither I have scattered thee. Yet I will not make a full end of thee. Isn't it funny? An American says God's going to wipe Israel out. You know what God says? I'll wipe out every other country. They will come to an end. You're the one that won't. Like I told you, some people need to smoke dope. It just give an excuse for explain why they say such stupid things. Uh, number seven, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 35. 
Uh, look what it says in verse 35. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me. That's that verse I told you. Wait till you see what, what it takes to get rid of Israel. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. And you say, well, in the millennium, they won't need the light of the sun. That's right, they won't need the light of the sun. Let me ask you a question. Is there any time when you don't use the lights in your house? When? Daylight. You open the curtain, and then you don't need the lights. But the light's still there. And then it gets dark and you use the light. You know why we need the sun? Because it's very, very dark. But when the light of the Lord permeates you, the universe, the, the light will still be there. We saw, it, you know what the sun will be? It'll be that little dark spot because of the brightness of the Lord. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 33, number 8, Jeremiah 33, verse, nine, uh, verse 7. And I will, I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel. How many of you in captivity? Are you in captivity? Well, whoever's getting out is getting out of captivity. So it's not us. I will cause the captivity of Judah, the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first. Oh, how did God build you at the first? Because he's going to build you just like he did the first, you Gentiles. How, oh, that's, not, that's right. He's, <laughs> he built Israel at the first, didn't he? On, the, uh, on page four, top, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I promised unto the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Guys, look at the prophecy over and over and over. How could anybody get up and say, God is done with Israel, when God keeps saying over and over and over, I am not done, I am not done, I am not done with them. Number nine, uh, Jeremiah 33, 20 through 26. Just look at verse 21. Then, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant. It talks about if night and day go away. Look down at verse 26. Uh, then will I cast away the seed of David. It talks about if you get rid of the stars and the moon, the ordinances. Look at number 10, <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 37, 1 through 12. Now, I like this. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 is the famous, the same famous valley of the dry bones. Now, now, guys, let me tell you what your problem is. Your problem is you know the Bible. I mean, even if you don't know much, you know the Bible, okay? Meaning, if they were doing a play today, uh, and they brought Jesus out, and then one by one they introduced the, uh, the, the, the apostles, when Judas stepped out, you'd go, boo! Because you already know. Do you understand they didn't? I think, what I think, I think that the other apostles probably thought he was the most trustworthy guy there was. They let him have the money. Could you see when they had to decide, who's going to be the treasurer? Peter says, I will. I'll take our money. I'm going to invest it in a place called Enron. <laughs> uh, no, Pete, I don't think so. Well, how about Matthew? He's got a good business mind. I've given enough of my money to Matthew. <laughs> the only guy they trusted was Judas. See, your problem is you know the end. Now, I'm going to say something, and you're going to give me the wrong answer. Can anybody part a sea and walk across on, on dry ground? No. Right? Nobody can. You know what your problem is? If you were standing on the bank of the Red Sea, and there it is, and here comes Pharaoh, and your son looks up and goes, Daddy, what are you going to do now? Says, Don't worry, son. God's probably going to part the Red Sea. We'll cross on dry ground. <laughs> you know how you know you wouldn't have said that? Because you got something way smaller than the Red Sea in front of you, and you're crying like a baby about it. Yeah. Why don't you scare this? Why can't you fix this? Why don't you do this? But our God can part the Red Sea so man can cross on dry. Guys, can anybody raise the dead? No. But you saw in this Bible, Old and New Testament, including the Lord, God can do it. So everything, everything, or can we ask you this? Can you float into the sky? Aren't you gonna? God. So so when I ask you this, if you see a, you ever see a carcass, a bones of a skeleton of an animal, can that thing live again? No. And everybody knows that. 
So he looks at this valley of bones. He says, uh, hey, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's brain says, of course they can. But boy, did he ever give the right answer. Look what he says. Verse 3. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. That's the answer, people. When you face the impossible, and you say, how, how are we going to get out of this? God can do it. God knows. God knoweth. He gave the answer. He gave the right answer. He didn't say, he personally can't believe it. But he said, you know. So just remember, Lord God knoweth. Verse, uh, chapter 5, chapter 5, middle of the page, verse 12. Or page 5, did I say chapter 5? Page 5, middle, of the, middle of, the, of the page, verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will, again, open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Prophetic. Number 11. Now watch the split fulfillment of this prophecy. Watch how part of it was fulfilled in 1948 and the rest is future. Look at verse 21. I say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they are gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Could you say that's what happened in 1948? You could say that, could you not? But look at the very next verse. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. Well, they don't have a king, do they? And there should, not be, there should no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Uh, look at uh, page 6, number 13, verse 7. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as the dew from the Lord. Verse 8. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles. Verse 9, Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. The people that hate the Jews will be cut off, not the Jews. Number 14, Zechariah chapter, I love this. I love this. Um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me show you something. Go to Matthew chapter 1. It's just better to look at the book for this. Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, this angel's talking to Jake, uh, Joseph. Joseph finds out that Mary's with child. He's going to dispose of her in a nice way. He doesn't want her killed. She should be stoned because she's been, she's been immoral. That's what he thinks. And so he wants to put her away quietly. And an angel comes and talks to him. Can anybody guess the name of the angel? Absolutely. It was Gabriel. It wasn't Michael because he continues on. Anyway, and, and look what it says. Verse 30, uh, 23. Behold, oh, verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Remember these words. God with us. You know what? If you say in Hebrew, Emmanuel, the E-L is God. Emmanuel, you are saying God with us. If somebody's name, I preach for a guy named Emmanuel in the uh, Philippines. Uh, that his name is God with us, okay? So, <clears throat> Emmanuel means God with us. So, this angel comes to Joseph and says, don't put her away, this thing is of God, and this baby's name is going to be Emmanuel. Right? Verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from, the sleep, uh, from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth the firstborn son, and called his name Emmanuel. No, he didn't call him Emmanuel. He said, hey, you're going to have a kid? His name's going to be Emmanuel. He says, hey, Joe, she had the baby. What do you call him? Jesus. <laughs> say, what? how could that be? Real simple. God with us. The Bible says, 
He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Instead, we know him as Jesus. And what does Jesus mean? It means Jehovah saves. Oh, that's what we need, isn't it? We need Jehovah saves. But he never got this. Now, I don't know if I mentioned it yesterday or sometime earlier. Before the Lord came to the manger, it, the Trinity was in heaven. Nobody ever said, let's go by the throne and see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They said, let's go by the throne and see the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. He got that name Jesus when he was born. Now, one of these days, the Lord's going to come back. He's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. He's going to rule the universe, correct? And nobody is going to say, well, let's go to Jerusalem and see Jesus. They're going to say, let's go to Jerusalem and see God with us. You say, are you sure about that? Turn your Bible to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. I love this passage. And this is future. Look at verse 22. Yea, many people and strong nations, here it is, shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. Is the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem now? No. Then there's going to be a day when he is, which we all believe, right? Well, look what they're going to do. Look what the nations are going to do when they go to Israel, go to Jerusalem. To seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord, thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that, what's it say? God is with you. That's Emmanuel. That's Emmanuel. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Guys, this is a good book. Now take it back. Okay, Steve, get this sound bite. The Bible is not a good book. It's the good book. It's not a good book on a list of good books. It is the good book, and it's the only one on the list. Say, how good is it? Watch God say this. Remember over and over, over and over? Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the, uh, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice, now watch, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. God with us, Emmanuel. But he's not done. And he shall dwell with them, Emmanuel. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. God with them, God with them, God with them. So one of these days, he's going to be with us. He's going to be with them, and people will go to Jerusalem. And it says people out of ten nations will grab a hold of a skirt of a Jew and say, you go to Jerusalem? Oh, man, you guys, can I go with you? Because we've heard God's with you. Because he is. Um, page 7. <clears throat> page 7. Look at uh, number 16 in uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 20 and 20, or chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. I will clean their blood that I have not cleansed. Guys, that's not us. He's talking about the, the bloody history of Israel, offering their children. Uh, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Number 17, Malachi 3, verse 8. I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Then I guess Israel will be disposed of when God changes. Because he said, I don't change, or you guys will be history. Number 18. Look at verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, and, uh, and, and um, let's, just, let's just read this passage, because this is good. Now, this is a verse that is, um, uh, it is a lot like uh, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. It's a lot like Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. There is a verse here that when I lead people to Christ, I, I have shown them this verse after they got saved. It's verse, it's verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, look at the bottom of page 7, 
I will be merciful to their righteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Is that what happened to you when you got saved? Yes. Yes. But that's not talking about you. It's a good verse to use that way. But look what he says. Verse 8. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Look at that. He's not going to dump them. He's going to renegotiate. <laughs> not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. He never made a covenant with your fathers. Uh, in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Is this future? He says, I will make this. I will put my law in their mind and write them in their heart, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. That's the future of Israel. That's from the lips of God. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every brother, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for ye shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, Israel's unrighteousness, and Israel's sins, and Israel's iniquities will I remember no more. I use that verse to show a saved person their sins are forgiven and forgotten, but that's talking prophetically about Israel. Now, one last thing. And that is the geography of the land of Israel. You got the Mediterranean Sea. You got the uh, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. You got the Mediterranean Sea. You got the Sea of Galilee. You got the Jordan River. And you got the Dead Sea. Now, how many of you <clears throat> have in the back of your Bible a map? You got a map of Israel? Now, you got probably several. Uh, you might have a, a map of Israel before Israel moved into the Promised Land. You might have a map of Israel under, under David, under the great kingdoms. But surely, if you've got a map, do you have a map that just shows what parts of Israel were possessed by what, what tribes? Right? You got one like that? All right, now, this isn't going to be exact, so I'm sure um, Stephen Anderson will point this out, that I'm, I'm changing scripture. But, but here's what you got. You got, like, this part of Israel belongs to one tribe, and this part of Israel belongs to another tribe, and this part of Israel belongs to another tribe, and this part of Israel belongs to another one. Isn't it broken up like that? Kind of like pieces of a puzzle. Go to Ezekiel chapter 48. Ezekiel chapter 48. God is going to divide that land to Israel again. But he is not going to do it like that. Here's what he's going to do. You've seen a ladder. When I say a ladder, I'm talking about a ladder. Lean it against a house and climb it. Ladder looks like, looks like this. Right? Here's what God's going to do. Take that ladder... and superimpose upon the land of Israel. By, by that, look at, uh, look at Ezekiel chapter 48. And look what he says. Verse 2. And by the border of Dan, from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Asher. Notice it doesn't say, you don't have some surveyor out there saying you're going around this mountain and you, you follow this creek. You know, many of our boundaries, they're, they're bounded by rivers. They're decided by rivers or mountain ranges. Isn't that true? You guys look at a map, and you go, why did they make that, that boundary so weird? And then you fly over, and you go, oh, that's the mountain range, or that's the river, 
But he said, in that day, Dan's boundary is going to be straight across from east to west. What does it say after that? Verse 3, and the border of Asher from the east side, even unto the west. So Dan will have one, and then Asher will have one. And every single tribe of Israel will have a, a boundary that it's just literally just a strip from east to west, straight line from the Jordan to the Med. Look at, um, and what it looks like is it looks like there's going to be here in the center where Jerusalem is, this is going to be a special area because when God gets through the first six, six uh, tribes, then he goes through that center part and then look at verse, uh, or, yeah, look at verse, I'll tell you in a second. Look at verse 23. As for the rest of the tribes, he's been talking about that center section. As for the rest of the tribes, from the east side to the west side, Benjamin shall have a portion. And from the border of Benjamin, from the east side to the west side, Simeon shall have a portion. By the border of Simeon, from the east side to the west side, Issachar will have a portion. Hey guys, if you're a Jew, which tribe are you? And if you pick one, how'd you, how'd you pick one? What do you, how do you explain the other 11? That is not you, and that is not me. That is Israel. And so God will put them back in their land, and they, he will divide that again. Now, I just got to tell you this, because this, this blesses my heart. Um, all of these... Uh, all of these uh, Scripture, where God says, I will bless Israel, I will bless Israel, I will bless Israel, I will establish him. Stephen Anderson and people like him who hate Israel, hate God's people, um, they've got, they got to find some way to negate that prophecy. Now, if they, if they try to say, well, those are talking about when Israel came into the land, they undo their own teaching because it shows God is still blessing them, right? So what they've got to do is say, well, when that's back in the Old Testament, when that is saying he's going to do that for Israel, he's talking about us. Do you understand? I hope he does. I hope you do. Because then he's saying what God said plainly to Israel didn't count for Israel. It was for another dispensation. You see, Stephen Anderson's a hyper-dispensationalist. He's just too dispensational for me. Let me explain it this way. I have a letter. You know what this letter says? Bring this letter to me, and I'm going to give you a million dollars. And it's signed, Donald Trump. I got a million bucks. I go to Donald Trump. I, hey, 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 got the letter. And he says, hey, dummy, look at the top of it. It says, Dear Eric. I wrote that to my son. I have a copy of the letter, but it isn't for me, is it? It's for his son. God, I got a copy of the Old Testament, but he wrote it to Israel. You understand? Oh, wait a second. Get this. Right under Donald Trump, there's a P.S. Know what it says? P.S. Also, whosoever presents a copy of this letter gets a million bucks too. Am I in now? I sure am. Is Eric out? Neither are Israel. We got into something, guys, but we didn't get in because somebody got kicked out. Do you understand? If he wrote that letter to Eric, it still counts for Eric. Even if we get in on it, it still counts for him. The, the, what God wrote to the Jews, he wrote to the Jews. But we get some stuff from the Old Testament, don't we? And you ought to be, you ought to be glad for it, and you ought to be blessed for it, and you ought to appreciate it. But guys, we are not God's replacement for Israel. Don't get greedy and don't get proud. And the Bible calls it boasting. Don't boast yourself against God's plan. Okay, preacher. Thank you for your time. Sorry it took so long. I hope it helped you. Yes, Sam, please. I said something tonight about the Jews fearing. Jews are fearing because of a replacement theology that's going on end up being anti-Jew. Uh, I have 
several individuals going around the country say that I'm anti-Jew and I believe in replacement theology can believe that. Some of these men I have, I have supported for years and years and years for tens of thousands of dollars. Shame that they'd make such a statement and be such a liar. But that happens at times. Remember um, J. Frank Norris walking down the street with one of his boys and uh, somebody came up to him and just cussed him a blue streak and his little boy was holding his hand, looked up, he said, Daddy, who is that? He said, I don't know, son. It's probably some folks I'd helped along the way. And that's about the way it is. When you help somebody along the way, the ones you help the most hurt you the worst. You know, it's amazing how, Brother Gip, how there's some that are okay with their interpretation, but they will never give us grace for our interpretation of the scriptures. That's what they will say. And it reminds me much of the liberals and the Democrats who, if it doesn't fit your narrative, you just shut everybody down. You'll never learn anything if you won't, if you, if you just block everybody out. Appreciate it tonight. Good on Israel. Father, thank you for tonight. We ask you, Lord, to bless uh, the teaching. And, Lord, I pray that we would uh, get these things fixed in our mind, re-study them, understand them. And, Lord, I'm glad you're not through with Israel, Lord. And as we have now for these many years, 35 years we've been here, Lord, we've been involved in ministries to Israel and been blessed by it. And Lord, I pray that we'd understand that they're still your chosen people, Lord. We understand that when they're, when they're good, they're good, and when they're bad, they're bad. We understand that, and they're... They need to be redeemed just like anybody else. I pray, Lord, please, that you would help in the teaching. And may, Lord, we understand some things and, and get some things straight in our minds and hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you deliver young men that are being sucked into some of this heresy, Lord. And I pray that uh, they would sit down and listen and re reconsider some things. pray that you'd help and bless now. Dismiss us in thy grace tonight and pray that, Lord, you would keep us safe and bring us back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. We ask, Lord, that you'd help us now in Jesus' name. And amen. I bless you in your decision. Yeah, offering. I'm sorry. You come right now if Thank you would, you please. Guys. Lord, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> come in. I actually have it right here. It's covered. That's a problem. I've asked you to give a good love offering. I have mine tonight. Make sure that you do if you would, please. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Every head bowed in the air. But if you'll ask, Lord, bless, please. Amen. please. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for being faithful. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, be in your places. If you would, and of course, the college on tomorrow, if you would. Take advantage of the book table when you leave tonight, if you would. Father, dismiss us tonight in thy grace in Jesus' name, and amen. God bless you. Be safe on your way home.